It seemed I had always had to justify my affinity for hockey. Friends and family couldn't understand it. And when I became a sports journalist, it was not until I left New York for a job in Raleigh, North Carolina, that I had a chance to cover hockey. Why would you want to do that? What if the players don't want to talk to you? What if you're the only black guy at the game? That happened a lot, by the way. Because I kept hearing those questions, because I occasionally was mistaken for a messenger while trying to enter an NHL arena, even though I was a journalist with a press credential dangling from my neck. And because I once had a beer-carrying Rangers fan in a Brian Leach jersey say to me the night I covered my first game back home at Madison Square Garden, what the fuck are you doing here? The Knicks ain't playing. I began to wonder how many black hockey players felt, I began to wonder how black hockey players felt in the same environment. I've interviewed many of them, as well as family members, teammates, opponents, coaches, general managers, journalists, and numerous others who make their living in hockey. Each black player I've found has had to wage a personal battle for acceptance and respect. Some eventually receive it, while others never do. But to every black man determined to make a way in professional hockey, self-respect has always mattered more. <clears throat> Facing abuse that is verbal, physical, or psychological because of their color and others' reaction to it has been an unfortunate reality for almost all of them. How black players dealt with that reality and continue to deal with it is what makes each one unique. But what unites them is a sheer love of the game and a desire to make the ice smoother for those who follow in their skate marks. The term black hockey player may seem like an oxymoron, but since the dawn of the 20th century, black players have overcome economic, geographical, racial, and cultural barriers that have a significant impact on the sport. How significant? Jerome Aginla, son of an African-born attorney skating on ice smooth by his progenitors, was named the NHL's most valuable player in the 2001-2002 season. Now let me stop. How many of you have ever heard of Jerome Ginla? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Black man was the most valuable player of the, in the NHL a decade ago. And he's still playing for the Pittsburgh Penguins. People don't know. It's one of the reasons I like doing what I do, to let people know these things. Breaking the Ice is the first book to tell the story of Aginla as well as his black peers and predecessors. It is the first book in which Aginla and other black hockey players talk candidly about themselves and one another. Of the more than 600 players on NHL rosters at the end of the 2003-2004 season, only 17 were black. However, that number represents a high watermark for blacks in any season in hockey's Premier League, which was formed in 1917. Yet because of the talent and determination of today's black players and their forebears, a career in hockey has become both realistic and, for many, lucrative. The NHL's 17 blacks in 2003-2004 played for a combined salary of $24.8 million. The all-time list of black NHL players numbers 38, it's higher now, and starts with Willie O'Ree, known as the Jackie Robinson of hockey, for breaking the league's color barrier in 1958. The list includes Grant Fuhrer, a goaltender who in 2003 became the first black inducted into the Hockey Hall of Fame and Mike Marson, a 1970s bonus baby, whose career was derailed by racial conflicts on and off the ice. I devote an entire <clears throat> chapter to Mike Marson in the book. He went through things that are just obscene. O'Ree, Fuhrer, and Marson are from Canada, as are nearly all the black men profiled in Breaking the Ice, men who overcame adversity, indifference, and hostility to make an indelible mark upon hockey. Yet the list also includes Mike Greer, the NHL's first African-American star, as well as players whose parents emigrated to Canada from the Caribbean or Africa, and players who have been adopted by white families and encouraged to partake in Canada's pastime. Absent from the list, but certainly not from these pages, is Herb Carnegie, a star in various hockey leagues for three decades who regrettably will be remembered as the best black player never to appear in the NHL. His story is chronicled here, as well as the ongoing effort to have him enshrined in the Hockey Hall of Fame. I'll stop there. Herb Carnegie died last year at the age of 96. The New York Rangers offered him a tryout in 1948, but he didn't trust it. He did go to Lake Placid upstate where the Rangers trained, and he was there for two weeks. And the Rangers made him three offers. First, they made him an offer to go to their lowest level minor league team in Tacoma, Washington. He turned it down. The next day after practice, they called him in and made him an offer to go to their second level minor league team in St. Paul, Minnesota. He turned it down. After the next day's practice, they made him an offer to go to their top farm team. 
New Haven, Connecticut for $4,700 a year. He turned it down because in semi-pro hockey in Canada, he was making more money. And given the exchange rate, it was even greater than the money the Rangers were offering him. So he was conflicted in that, should I go to the minor leagues and risk never being called up? Or should I go back to Canada where I have a wife and three kids and I'm successful? But it's not the NHL. And this was 1948, so there were no player agents then. No one to counsel her Carnegie to, in my opinion, look at the bigger picture. Had he taken the offer and gone to New Haven, he would have been just one step away from the NHL. And the Rangers were a terrible team then. They were having trouble drawing fans at Madison Square Garden. So if you have a black player in your top minor league team playing well, you would think they would have called him up and given him a chance. But he turned the offer down. And I found out in doing the research for this book, the Rangers strategy was not all that different from what Branch Rickey did with Jackie Robinson. When Jackie Robinson was a flat out superstar for the Kansas City Monarchs of the Negro Leagues, Branch Rickey did not say, I want you to join the Brooklyn Dodgers right away. He wanted to be sure. He wanted to be sure Jackie Robinson could handle the inevitable racial slights and slurs, bean balls, and all the other nonsense he had to deal with. All the abuse that basically took his life at such a young age. And if you saw the movie 42, they conveniently leave out that Jackie Robinson died at the age of 53. He internalized so much abuse that he died still a young man. But the Dodgers strategy, Branch Rickey's strategy with Jackie Robinson was to have him go to the Montreal Royals for the entire 1946 season. We don't care how well you play at Montreal, we're sending you there for the entire year to see if you can handle what happens on the field as well as off the field. And when Jackie proved he could handle it, they brought him up to the Brooklyn Dodgers April 15, 1947, and everything changed. And yeah, he continued to catch holy hell as a Brooklyn Dodger, but he handled it. And because he handled it so well, he opened doors for so many other black athletes. And one more thing before I conclude. If, how many of you saw the movie 42? Yeah. OK. I hope more of you see it, even though it's, I would say, a Jackie Robinson primer. You can see it and start with that. And then I hope you'll seek out literature on Jackie Robinson. But it's a good starting point. I bring it up because there's a character in the book who was presented almost as Jackie's chauffeur, a gentleman named Wendell Smith. Wendell Smith was a great sports writer for the Pittsburgh Courier who co-wrote Jackie Robinson's autobiography and was really the, the one journalist that Jackie Robinson trusted more than any other, writing for a black newspaper, at the time a daily. And that was not brought out adequately in the film, but again, when you're the writer, you have the power of the pen. You tell the story your way. That's why I, I hope that there are people here who are interested in journalism, and if you are, you use me as a resource, I would love to encourage you to get into journalism. And there are more ways to do it now than ever. It doesn't have to be newspapers, it can be online, but we need more people telling our story the right way. Because when others tell it, there's no guarantee that they're going to tell the story fair or accurately. Thank you. So interesting, I was trying to remember if Jackie Robinson was brought up to the Major League team in 47 or 48, and it was 47, 47. so but the same years anyway as the hockey player.